reading this morning from Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 45. And Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this um, scripture. As always, your word inerrantly, infallibly passed on to us, and we are so appreciative that you have chosen to speak to us in words that we can understand. And Lord, we pray that now you will help us to uh, absorb and to um, get what the meaning is behind what we have just read as we look at, at that this morning. Lord, we pray this morning for those who are um, sick. We, uh, it seems like we have many right at the moment. We think of Dennis and Dory as they are even now getting ready to go to uh, Phoenix, to Mayo Clinic, to check out this cancer that has recurred in Dennis. And we pray that you would, uh, Lord, especially uh, help the doctors as they diagnose. We pray that there will be treatment that would be uh, adequate for Dennis. Give comfort as it's needed. We pray for uh, John who had the gallbladder surgery this week and ask that you will raise him up. We pray that uh, there will be no more procedures needed. We understand he's still not feeling real well. Gary, who had to leave this morning, not feeling well. Others who will be uh, facing uh, different procedures perhaps this week as well. Um, don't usually spend this much time on the detail, but it just seems like we have a number right now, Father. And so we commit them to you. We thank you that we have doctors, and we thank you that we have options, and uh, we pray for correct diagnosis, and we pray for... Uh, Lord, that you will guide the hands of surgeons and, and the uh, ways in which they approach these problems, and we thank you for them. But Lord, our great physician ultimately is you. We trust you to be the one who is the ultimate uh, in every way that there is, including regarding our physical health. And so we commit this all to you. Thank you for those who are representing us in far places as our missionaries. And, uh, Lord, the giving of our congregation last year invited, enabled us to give to many of them year-end gifts uh, over and above what we normally do. We pray that you will multiply that, that you will use it for your glory as they receive these things. And, Lord, we pray that you'll give encouragement where it's needed and uh, strengthening. Now we pray that your word will overtake us, overwhelm us. It's not enough to be a hearer. We must be doers. Pray that that will be true, and this that'll be true this morning. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen. If you're not haven't turned yet, Luke 19 would be our place this morning, as we uh, as we uh, regard this passage of scripture about the cleansing of the temple. I came across uh, this little story one time about a mater d at a very pl plush restaurant, posh restaurant. I guess would be the better term, right? And uh, whoever was interviewing asked him, well, listen, what would, you know, suppose you had this. Your establishment is very, uh, uh, very upscale. Suppose you had a streaker walk in the door. What would you do? And the maitre d' said, well, I'd give him a tie. No one is allowed in without a tie. And I thought when I read that, I thought, you know what? That is exactly what religion gives to people. It gives them a tie and leaves them naked as a jaybird before God. Because that is not what God requires. The ritual and the methodologies that are sometimes given to us as being the thing that will make us right with God. This was the problem, as you know, if you've been with us, with the Judaism of Jesus' time. They were handing out tithes right and left. In fact, in some cases, even charging for them. But it was not what was required. Theirs was dead formalism, an abomination to God that they thought they were buying off. And you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a new problem in the time of Christ, that it existed for a long time. You can find a lot of passages in the Old Testament that deal with it. Here's one of them from Isaiah. Just listen to what God said to his own people 700 years before Christ. 
He said, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. Now you have to ask yourself, well, wait a minute. Wasn't it, you know, if I, if I got that word from God, I think I'd be saying, well, but, but you're the one who, pres- aren't you the one who told me to bring these sacrifices? Yes. Yes, he was, was he not? But they were to be brought, you see, out of a heart of love for him and out of faith in their hearts for what was coming. And they were looking at the sacrifice itself as being the thing that was going to save them. They were going through the motions. And sacrifice without faith equals religion, and God hates it. It's not just a case of it's not good. God hates it because it's taking people completely in the wrong direction. And that's Jesus' message here in the cleansing of the temple. You know, Jesus cleansed the temple twice. Once at the beginning of his ministry in John chapter 2, where he began to teach the people, hey, there's a new temple in town. It's me. You tear it down, and in three days I'll raise it back. Of course, they didn't understand what he was saying at the time, but they realized later that was the implication. He cleansed the temple then, and here he is cleansing it again near the end of his ministry. He came into town on the day of the, quote, triumphal entry, and one of the things he did before he left town that night was he went and looked at the temple. He took it all in, and then he went away, as he did every day that week, the last week of his life. He would come into town during the day, would leave at night, and he came back the next day with a vengeance. Now, the people, all these who are there that are residents of Jerusalem, some of them who are followers of his that have come down from Palestine, others who are in from all parts of the world because this is the time of Passover, the people are thinking, this is the time. He's offered himself as the Messiah and as the king, which he had done just the day before. So obviously this, this may be the day. This is, this is the day when he's, when he's going he's gonna to attack Fort Antonia over there or he's going to attack Herod's uh, uh, Pilate's house. He's going to take the Romans on. But Jesus does not attack the Romans. Jesus attacks instead the heart of Judaism, the temple. What a surprise. But Jesus knew, you see, that he needed to declare war not on the Romans who had truly enslaved the Israelite people physically. He needed to attack the slavish Judaism system that had enslaved the people spiritually. The Jews were in far more danger from their own leaders than they were from the Romans. They just didn't realize that. But Jesus did. And when he saw what was going on in the temple, it lit him on fire like it had before. And for a few days at least, the temple was going to be what it was meant to be. So what was it meant to be? Well, from study of the Old Testament, we know that the temple was intended to be the place where God reaches down to his people and where the people can come to meet God. It's a meeting place. It's being replaced now. God had long ago left this temple, 700 years before, Ezekiel 8 through 11. You can read about it. That temple was done and over and done with. But the new temple is Jesus. Jesus is now the one who's going to be the ultimate priest He's the one who will be the ultimate sacrifice to which all of the other sacrifices were looking forward. He is the one who will be the ultimate temple. He is the place now where people will come to meet God and where God will meet the people. It's been that way ever since. But beloved, we can turn, we can turn this new temple into a religion just like the people in Jesus' time turned their temple into a religion. Religion can hand us a tie in the form of some ritual or something that we're supposed to go through and do, and we think, if I just do that, I'm good to go. And yet we are standing there naked before a holy God because ritual will not do. Religion will not do. There must be a relationship. So how do we prevent 
ending up the same way as these people did. What is it that if this temple is no longer valid that Jesus is coming to, what is the right way to have a relationship with God? And we can see that in this passage. Three things that Jesus shows here in this passage and that Luke will identify for us that, that defines a true relationship with God. Three things. Number one, a true relationship with God is delivered by Christ. Is delivered by Christ. Now, turn back with me to Malachi. If you're in Luke, go to Mark, then to Matthew, and then Malachi. It's the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3. Because when Jesus entered the temple that day, it was in partial fulfillment of a 400-year-old prophecy in Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, here is the word that God gave to the Israelites through Malachi. He said, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. In other words, this is somebody who's going to bring cleansing. Now notice there are two messengers in this passage in Malachi. One who prepares the way and a second one who is the Lord and messenger of the covenant. What covenant is he talking about? He's talking about the new covenant. And some of you have studied covenant relationships in the Bible. Some of you have not. Just a, a very quick lesson. The, one of the covenants in the Bible was the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, which was basically the law, right? Which was given to show the need for salvation and then given to show how people should live once they have come to faith. Showed them the need, showed them how to live once they have accepted God's provision by faith. The Old Covenant. But the Old Covenant was not sufficient to save anyone in and of itself. So there's a new covenant that's defined in Ezekiel 36 and in Jeremiah 31. You could read about it. It's a covenant that God says, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to do this with the new covenant. I'm going to put the law in their heart instead of writing it on stone. I'm going to provide a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone the hard heart that comes naturally that we're born with. I'm going to provide cleansing of that heart. I'm going to provide forgiveness. That's all part of the new covenant. And that's what Jesus came to provide. How? Through his death and resurrection on our behalf. We've sung about it this morning. That's why he says in Luke 22, when he initiates the Lord's Supper, he says, this is my blood of the new covenant. He seals that covenant with his blood. That's the thing that pays for it. makes it possible. That messenger is Jesus. So the second messenger is easy to identify. It is Jesus. But who's the first messenger in Malachi 3? The one who prepares the way. Well, if you've been with us, you've heard that language way back in Luke 3, right? The one who prepares the way. Now, in Matthew 4, Malachi 4, verse 5, he is described as being Elijah. He identifies him as Elijah. But Jesus gives further definition to that in, in Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 7, where Jesus says this concerning uh, this, this messenger, because there are, there, he says it's John the Baptist is this messenger, but there are conditions that attach to that. And so he says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 13, for all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, if you are willing to accept it, he, John, is Elijah who is to come. In other words, if these people, as we looked last week, had been accepting of Jesus rather than ultimately by the end of this week rejecting of Jesus, the prophecies that have been the, the prophecies of the old in the Old Testament regarding both the first and the second coming of Christ would have been fulfilled in the prophecy of this 
of, of this particular passage in Malachi would have been fulfilled, and John the Baptist would have been the guy that was represented by Elijah. But they were not willing. So this is not the final fulfillment. This is another preview of coming attractions. This is a coming of Jesus to the temple to cleanse it, but it's not the final fulfillment of that prophecy. That awaits another coming and another cleansing, which will be coming. Will be coming. But here is a preview, and meanwhile the preview is convincing. Luke says, if you're back in Luke chapter 19, he says in verse 45, there, and Jesus began to, Jesus entered the temple and he began to drive out those who sold. Now, Matthew adds a little bit of flavor to that. In Matthew 21, he says, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the table, tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Most of you are aware that the temple was not just a single building, right? It was a it was, in fact, in the time of Jesus, a magnificent building that was, at that time, 46 years in building, ended up being 60 before it was completed. It was a beautiful building that Herod had built, started building, for the Jewish people, trying to curry favor with them. So it was a magnificent structure in the middle of this whole thing. That was the holy place. And that was enclosed, and that was a building. But around that, still part of the temple was a series of courtyards. First, there was a courtyard of the men, called the, the men's courtyard. Only Jewish men could go into that courtyard. Only priests could go into the holy place. Only Jewish men could go as far as the men's courtyard. Then there was a women's courtyard where Jewish men and women could go. The men, women could go no further than that. And then there was a large, very large Gentile courtyard where the Gentile people could go. But they were not allowed to go beyond that. In fact, they have found uh, an inscription that was on the wall going into the women's courtyard that basically said to any Gentile who entered there, you will lose your life. You go, you go beyond this point at the risk of your life. And so we know that the things that were said about that are true. They were only allowed to go so far. Now, at, at Passover... Josephus tells us somewhere between a million and two million, you want to cut the numbers in half, you're probably closer to the fact, but let's say a half a million to a million people are coming to Jerusalem each year at Passover time. And they are coming from all parts of the world because it's a requirement that they come and offer sacrifices at Passover. Not all of them could come every year, although some, like Jesus' family, made the 90-mile ride from, from, uh, from uh, Galilee every year down to Jerusalem for the Passover. So many came, and they came from many places, came from many countries where the Jews had been spread. And they would come to this Passover, and they would be prepared to offer their offerings. The problem was, they, number one, they had to change money. They could not give money in the, in the, in the temple except that which was accepted by them, and it, they would not accept foreign money. So there was a need to change money, and there was a need to buy sacrificial animals. Could be lambs, could be goats, could be pigeons for those who were poor. But what had happened is... The, the, the priest, the high priest, and the Sadducees, which is the priestly caste in Palestine at that time, had set up the Gentile courtyard basically as a place of merchandise, a place of commerce. And they were changing money, and they were selling animals. Only they were doing both at high rates of interest and at exorbitant cost. So Jesus is angry. He's angry that it's going on in the first place, let alone that it's there basically to fleece people. The priests are doing this. It's not like they're providing services at cost. They're fleecing the people who come to worship. This is what they have done in this courtyard. They have corrupted the temple. What should have been a place of worship, a place of Prayer, a place of coming to God and meeting God, was instead turned into the smells and the sounds of a barnyard. No wonder Jesus was angry, right? So when he sees this, beloved, he is not the meek and mild Jesus that you so often hear about. 
He is all fury and ferocity as he single-handedly throws out scores of merchants. Amazing. Can you imagine how thorough his angry must, anger must have been to drive all of these animals out, to overturn the money tables, and to, and to keep them out for the next two or three days? It's an amazing display of the power of Jesus and the power of God. It's a preview of the greater judgment of his second coming, but it's impressive in and of itself, right? Now this clears space for the next two or three days for teaching in the temple. It's what it was intended to be. It returns the temple for a time to its rightful use. It also establishes Jesus as the ultimate temple. What we're going to see as we go through the rest of Luke, and especially these last few days in the temple before Jesus' crucifixion, is an amazing display of his ability to counter the arguments of those who come against him, to turn them away. The best and brightest of his time are coming against him, and he turns them all away. Because divine wisdom doesn't have a lot of problem with human wisdom. But he faced the best and the brightest during those days. It'll be an interesting thing to see. But from here on, God meets man only through Jesus. Now, I want you to see two ways that Jesus leads us to God. Two ways that we can see in this passage that Jesus leads us to God. Number one, he leads us to God as a mediator. He is a mediator. One of the things he's called is the mediator of the new covenant. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. What Moses prefigured, Jesus actually fulfills as a mediator. Now, what is a mediator? Well, a mediator is a go-between, right? Any of you who have worked with contracts at all know that you have potentially clauses that deal with mediatorship that says instead of going to court, we will go to mediation if we have disagreements and we will sit down and we will allow a mediator to hear both sides and then to represent one side to the other and come up with the solution. He's a go-between. Jesus is the ultimate mediator. He's a mediator because he brings God to us through his death in our place, paying the penalty for our sins, and he brings us to God if we by faith will exercise faith in what he has done in his death in our place so that we can come to God. Jesus is the ultimate mediator. How do we see that? Because he throws all the animals out of the temple. Why? Because they're not needed anymore. They're not needed anymore. There is not, after Thursday of this week, there is not one more valid Old Testament sacrifice ever. Why? Because what all those Old Testament sacrifices pointed forward to was what? The final and ultimate and only official death on behalf of uh, paying the penalty by death on, behalf of, uh, on behalf of those who are sinners. And Jesus accomplished that later in the week. The Passover lamb was here. And so he dismisses all the rest of them because he is the mediator between God and man. Paul knew that. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, for there is one God... And there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Jesus is the mediator. This is unbelievably good news. It's good news for us as sinners. It's good news for us who are outside of Christ because now there's a possibility that we can be right with God. It's good news for those of us who are in Christ. You know why? I'll tell you why. It's because we get a glimpse. What, what is Satan doing? We have this vision of Satan going around the world tempting us to sin and all the rest of it, which, is, which he is doing through him and his minions and so on. But I'll tell you what else Satan is doing day and night. Revelation 12 pictures it. Revelation 12, read that sometime, and you'll find out what Satan is doing. Satan is before the Father bringing accusations against us. And let me tell you, he doesn't have to make these up. Right? We give him all the ammunition that he needs any given day. As you're sitting here this morning, he's got plenty of ammunition. I don't know where your mind is or what you're thinking of. I just know you're not any more perfect than I am. Right? 
And so while we are worshiping God, and hopefully we're doing a good job of that, we're also thinking about the things that are going to come down the pike tomorrow. We're thinking about this or that. Lustful thoughts even come into our minds when we're sitting here, as amazing as that. See, I mean, we're, we're sinners, beloved, even as Christians. So Satan looks down and he just says, did you see what Dave just did? Got him. And what's God the Father? God the Father says, yeah, I saw that, I know that. And my advocate, Jesus, my mediator, steps to the front and says, but Father, it's true he did it, but Dave is mine. He's accepted my death in his place. He's covered by my righteousness. Don't you see? And the Father says, oh yeah, I knew that. I see that. I know the sin, but I know he's covered. He's untouchable. That's what my mediator is saying. What's your mediator saying? Who is your mediator? I hope it's not you. Your mediator can only be Jesus. He's the only one. Do you see all the reasons over and over and over through the Bible why Jesus is the only way? It's not just because he said, I'm the only way. It's because of all the things that he's done and is doing. Do you have a mediator? Somebody said, I don't know, it was one of these, I don't know, programs or something like Art Linkletter used to ask all these five-year-olds all these questions, right, and get all these, you know, answers that only five-year-olds can give. And he asked one time, what's a grandmother? And this little kid said, oh, a grandmother? A grandmother is somebody who comes to visit and keeps your mother from spanking you. <laughs> we need grandmothers, right? Same as we need a mediator who is much greater than any other grandmother or anyone else, right? Because Jesus is the one mediator who can still forever the judicial hand of God, right? He's the only one. Legally, judicially, if you're in Christ, no accusation can ever be made against you to take you out of his hands, never. Does that mean that God doesn't discipline us as, his, as a father? Of course he does. He says, those whom I love, I discipline. We can expect his disciplining hand in our life. But as, as someone who can take away our salvation, who can take us from the hands of God, never. Jesus said, no one can take me out of Take, take you out of the hands that God has delivered you into, into his hands. Jesus is the mediator. Secondly, so he's, he is, he is, salvation is, a relationship with God is delivered by Christ as mediator. Secondly, it's delivered by Christ as master. As master. Do you, do you see Jesus asking permission to cleanse the temple? Did you notice where he went up and said uh, to the high priest, hey, look, I'd like to, you know, you got a mess going on here, I'd like to clean it up. Do you see him doing that? He doesn't do that, right? Now, let, let me ask you this. You come over to my house tomorrow, and you start looking around, and you think, oh, man, this, this furniture needs to be changed. I need to, I need to move this around, right? Are you going to start moving the, the furniture around in my house? You're not going to do that. You might think it should be moved, right? But you're not actually going to get up and start moving it around. Why? You're too nice to do that. Only person who moves the furniture around is the owner, right? The owner gets to decide, I want it here, not there. You don't get to decide that. Even if you tried to come into my house and move the furniture around, I probably wouldn't care, but I guarantee you my wife would care, <laughs> right? You can't do that. So why is Jesus here rearranging all the furniture in the temple? Because it's his. Right? He owns it. What did he say at the age of 12 when his mom and dad couldn't find him and he was in the temple, you know, debating with the scribes and all the rest of it? Didn't you know I had to be here in my father's house about my father's business? This is my place. This is my house. He's acting like he's the owner because he is the owner. And he acts like God because he is God. And there's only room 
for one God in the temple, and there's only room for one God in any given life. All the other gods have to go, do you see? So when you invite Jesus into your heart, it has to be at the expense of all your other gods, of whom we have hundreds, all of us do. They have to go, beloved. If you think you can invite Jesus as Savior and then go on living any way you want, I have news for you. You don't know what salvation is. You don't understand saving faith. It's not that the change in your life saves you. It doesn't. It's just that when you're saved, you will change because you've submitted your life to him as Savior. And Lord, you don't want to do the things you used to do anymore. It's all or nothing. Romans 10.9 says, but if you confess Jesus as Lord, Master, King, boss, any word you want that will communicate to you that he's now in charge. If you confess Jesus as Lord and believe it in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus doesn't show up and say, let's negotiate. He doesn't do that. Which commandments do you like and which do you think are outdated? How about, you know, five out of ten? Could we, could we, could we agree on that? You, you, you can't tithe? Well, how much could you do? Can you do 2%? I mean, you know, look, the average is three and a half. Can you do that? Jesus doesn't show up like that. Sundays, you can't be here on Sunday. You can't give a couple hours a week to the Lord. When the, when, when the, when the, when the Bible, the, the, the commandment says to, to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, you can't, you, you can't, well, how many can you do? Can you do one out of four? Once every six weeks, how often can you be here? It's not a negotiation. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of all, beloved, or he's not Lord at all. Do you see? We don't do this perfectly. None of us do this perfectly. But if our heart isn't turned in that direction, true repentance hasn't happened. All we're involved in then is self-deception. When the real Jesus comes, transformation happens. That's all I can tell you. I've seen it over and over in the lives of people, in my own life. And again, it's not perfection. It's transformation of a heart, but he re- begins to rearrange the furniture. Otherwise, there's no relationship. You just, we just have an active imagination. <laughs> I love this story. Um, I've been waiting for a long time to use this, so I, I think it's a good illustration. There was a guy named, some of you, I probably don't think it's as good as I am, but I like it. A guy named Alain Enthoven. Enthoven. He was a young, well-built, you know, he was, he, was, he was just one of these ambitious guys who was in Washington, D.C. in the early 60s. He became part of the Kennedy administration, part of Robert McNamara's Defense Department. And he was a gung-ho go-getter. And so early on in the administration, he was asked to go visit the U.S. Air Force base in Germany. And so he went, and he was met, as you would expect, by an assortment of generals and high-ranking, you know, military officials with, you know, yards of ribbons and medals and whatever else. And they started the meeting, and as they started the meeting, one of the generals got up and, sa- and started to inform young Enthoven of what they were going to tell him in the briefing, t- trying to outline the points of a briefing. Well, he listened for about two minutes, and then he stood up and he said, General, I don't think you understand. I'm not here to get a briefing. I'm here to tell you what we've already decided. Young Enthoven. He understood authority. He understood lordship. Beloved, those who come to faith in Christ have to understand the same thing. Jesus is Lord. You can't take him as anything else. Now, Jesus does say this. This is, this is I love this. You know, Matthew 11, verse 30, he says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love that reminder. What he's saying is basically this. I'm going to do a lot better for you than you will ever do for yourself. I'll take care of you. 
I will never lead you somewhere that would be bad for you. You're going to lead yourself in all kinds of places that would be bad for you. You will find, if you will really follow me, that what I ask you to do is going to bring joy to your heart. It may bring death physically to you wherever you go, but you can die with joy because my burden is light. My yoke is easy. It leads to eternal life. Aren't you glad for that? But Jesus has to be Lord. He can't be anything else. So a true relationship with God then is delivered by Jesus. Secondly, a true relationship by God is devoid of hypocrisy. It's devoid of hypocrisy, it's, which is another way of saying, I hesitated over using this word because it communicates so many different things, but it's, what it's basically saying is a relationship with God requires this, beloved. It requires that we be absolutely open with God and open with ourselves. You can't have a true relationship with someone and you're closed off. How would your marriage work if both of you have secrets all the time that the others don't know? You have no relationship. A true relationship with God is one that is open. It's where you're acknowledging yourself to be who you are and what you are and thanking God for making you who he can make you to be. But no hypocrisy. That was not the case here. Look at these scoundrels that Jesus is driving out. Jesus says to them in verse 46, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. That's a combination of two Old Testament passages. A combination of two Old Testament passages in one sentence. The first one, My house shall be a house of prayer, comes from Isaiah 55, Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. We won't look at it or turn to it, but what it basically is saying, Jesus is, uh, 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 Isaiah there is addressing foreigners. He's addressing non-Israelite people. And he's basically identifying to them, you are in, invited in too. This isn't just for Israel. Remember the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12. God blessed Abraham so he could be a blessing to whom? The whole world. It was never about just Israel. It was about Israel as a channel to the rest of the world. And so in Isaiah 56, Isaiah is inviting these foreigners, these non-Jews in, those who want to meet Jehovah and pray and worship in the temple. And that's why this is so abominable, because as Jesus walks into the temple, the court of the Gentiles, the place that has been specifically designated for them, has been turned into nothing but a marketplace. There's no room for Gentiles or anybody else in there except the scoundrels who are making money out of this. Inexcusably arrogant abuse of God's whole purpose in the temple. I want to meet everybody there. They're just fleecing people. But equally bad is the second quote, and it's from Jeremiah. So let's, let's turn to that one. Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 7 That's where this quote comes from. And the quote is actually from verse 11, Jeremiah 7, verse 11, where God is saying this to his own people, the Israelites, through Jeremiah. He says, Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? It's a question, but it's a rhetorical question because he goes on and says, Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. So he's saying, Have you made my temple into a house of robbers? And then he says, um, Yeah, you have. I know it. I've seen it. And if you back up to verse 8 of Jeremiah 7, you'll see what he means. He says, Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, Commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered. Only to go on doing all these abominations. Sound familiar? These are the people who live like they want all week and come to church on Sunday for absolution. Hypocrites. It was going on in Israel. It's nothing new. <laughs> it's 
It's been going on since man was first created, right? And when Jesus is saying, you've made my house a den of robbers, that's what he has reference to. It's obvious that they're doing that through the way that they're fleecing the people, but all of these same sins could be applied. And then they're coming to the, to the temple, and they're offering their sacrifice, and they're saying, I'm good to go. And God is saying, you're not good to go, you're gone. You're gone. You don't belong to me. You have no heart for me. Your faith is not in me. Your faith is in some substitutionary sacrifice that has no value because it represents the hypocritical heart. You're counting on that to cover for you to do whatever you want. God has seen the Israelites worship any idol, participate in any sin, cut any corner, cheat any rival, and then come to the temple and think they can wipe it clean and then go back and do the same thing the next week. I, I, you know, if, I'll tell you they remind me of. Well, they remind me of me. They do. But more, they remind me of some of the neighbor Catholic kids that we grew up with. Because I would watch them as they grew up go to confession on Saturday and then come back and do all the same things over the next week that they'd been doing before that they had confessed. It wasn't real. It was a thinking, if I go through this ritual, I'm going to be okay. Ritual will never cut it. Religion will never cut it. Do you see? That's what God is trying to communicate here. Jesus is saying, God is saying here, yeah, I see you on the Sabbath, but I, see, I also see you all the other days of the week when you're living like pagans and thinking that you're going to be dissolved of your sins just because you go through this little ritual. And he says in verse, if you're still in Jeremiah, look at verse 15. Here's, how, here's what God thinks about that kind of thinking. I will cast you out of my sight. That's eternal condemnation. Jesus uses exactly the same words when he said, so there are going to be people standing before me in the day of judgment saying, didn't we do this in your name? We did that in your name. We cast out demons. A lot of things that we haven't done. And I'm going to say to you, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who work iniquity. He even says in verse 16, boy, you talk about strong language in Jeremiah he says, by the way, don't bother to pray for these folks because I won't hear you. Whoa. You know what? Hypocrisy to us is a small thing. It's not a small thing to God. Hypocrisy is just Adam and Eve trying to cover up with their own devices like they did in the Garden of Eden, and God had to seek them out. We can be the same way. A couple guys go fishing on a Sunday morning, right? They've been out there for a couple hours, and they're not catching anything, and one of them starts to feel kind of guilty, you know. So he says, you know, we're not catching anything. I wonder if, you know, probably, we probably should be in church. And the other guy says, nah. He said, he said I'm not bothered. He said, if I was home, my wife, wife is sick. I couldn't leave her to go to church anyway. Yeah, you, you think, is it coming to you as you think about it? Spin doctors. Hip hypocrites? Hypocrites have no relationship with God. What he's talking about here is total, complete openness before the Father. They did not have that. They thought they were covering over with the rituals and the little motions that they were going through, and it will not work. Relationship with God is has to be devoid of hypocrisy. Finally, so it's delivered by Christ, it's devoid of hypocrisy, it's devoted to truth. A relationship with God has to be devoted to to truth. After Jesus cleansed the temple for the next three or four days, peace reigned in Jerusalem. No commercial activity, no cheating people. Jesus moved in and took over. It was, after all, his father's house. Now, we're going to see next week what the reaction to this would be. You'll love it. But, but here he is. He's going home at night, or going probably out to Bethany, uh, doesn't really tell us for sure, but he's leaving every night going somewhere, probably to Bethany, to the home of, I imagine, the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And then he's coming back each day. You know, it's, it's crowded. They had, you had all these people there. There's, it's not like there's hotels and Marriott's and stuff like that. You've got to find your own place. And so he's going away. 
sleeping, maybe camping out sometimes. We don't know, but wherever he does, and he comes back in the next day and he begins to teach. Verse 47, he was teaching daily in the temple. And the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. They did not find anything they could do for all the people were hanging on his words. Listen, why didn't they just take their temple back? Really, I'll tell you, this is really easy. Because there were half a million people there who were hanging on Jesus' every word. How many of them were listening to the preaching? I don't know. We're not told. But you can imagine there were throngs of people that were interested in this guy that had ridden in on the cult. And then he had cleansed the temple. And so they're coming back each day to find out, well, where is this going? And the rulers are coming. First, we're going to see the, you know, the Pharisees come against him. And then the Sadducees. And finally, you know, the best of the best are coming against him. And they're all interested and they're hanging on to every word before they finally decide at the end of the week to crucify him. But there they are. And so the leaders can't do anything. But what is Jesus doing? He's teaching He's doing what he was always doing. He even left in Mark 1, read it, you'll find he even leaves the healing meeting so that he can go preach in other places. That was the cornerstone of his ministry, was the preaching and the teaching. And you remember what, what, what is constantly brought to our attention, Mark eleven eighteen 18 would be one example. He taught as one having authority. They were astonished at his teaching. It was the word of God. I mean, if you want to know God, beloved, it doesn't happen through visions and dreams and, you know, emotional experiences and all that stuff. All of that may, may attach to it. Some of us are more emotional than others, and some of us are going to have greater emotional experience. That, but if, you, if your faith in God, if your relationship with God is dependent on an emotional experience, you're going to be in one day and out the next. Do you see that? It's the Word. What, is, what does he say? What does Paul say in Romans 10? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. That's why Jesus is preaching. That's why he's teaching. Because that's how you come to faith. And they were astonished. Why were they astonished? You know, I don't think this one is that hard to figure out. They are astonished because he's teaching them with authority about things that you can't find out through human experience and through human experimentation. He's beyond the natural world when he begins to talk about heaven. I mean, you can't run an exper experiment and find out, was there a heaven or is there not? You can't do that, right? It's not possible. He's talking about heaven, and he's talking about hell, and he's talking about judgment, and he's talking about a God who loves, and he's talking about a God who... He's talking about all these things that can't be... You can't test these in a laboratory. These are beyond the realm of our normal experience. So naturally, they're astonished as he, teach, as he teaches them. They're so important that, because it's the only way we can understand these things is if God revealed them to us, and that's what Jesus is doing. John 17, 17, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. They're hanging on to his every word because they're recognizing this must be truth. They were astonished. He revealed God to them in his, in his words. You know what, if that word, to, to us, of course, the words of Jesus have come to us in the Bible. And we have to ask the question, if that word, the Bible, if it is accurate about the things that can be tested, archaeology, history, predictive prophecy, which it is, then can it not be trusted about those things which we cannot test? Doesn't that make sense? So Jesus is teaching through special revelation things that cannot be understood in the realm of human experience. They are above and beyond that. Relationship with God is dependent on that. That's why his word is so crucial. You know, here's two distant people that they, they, they're kind of falling in love with each other. So what do they do? Well, they communicate with words. Words is the key to it, right? In the old days, they wrote letters back and forth. And then later, they, you know, phone called back and forth. Now they text and Twitter and tweet, and I don't know what else. But somehow they fall in love in the middle of all that Twittering and tweeting, right? Somehow. Because it's words. It's all words. 
And that's what we have here in the Bible. We have God's permanent, exclusive gift to his people. You can't bypass it if you want to know him. And once you've come to him in faith, you can't bypass it if you want to keep living a Christian life. This is the word of truth. This is the word that sanctifies. That's why Peter says, listen, like, just like newborn babies love their bottles. You ever been around them? You know, we'll have a couple of them that'll be letting loose here in a minute, right? Because they want their bottle. He says, that's the way you should want the word. That's how important it is to you. Hunger for the word should be a part of the normal human Christian experience. So we want to be in it daily for ourselves. We want to be in preaching services where we can hear it. We want to be in teaching places where we can hear it. We want to know the word. It's like, you know, it's, it's like the college student. He went in and bought all these ingredients for you know, cookies. He, the flour, the eggs, the sugar, brown sugar, vanilla, chocolate chips. Couldn't be cookies if it's not chocolate chips, right? So he buys all this stuff, and he gets up to the counter, and he's, and he's running them through, and the clerk looks at all this stuff, and then there's, you know, three bags of cookies that are coming along at the end, already made. And the clerk says, oh, you're getting those in case the home, homemade ones don't turn out? And he says, no, I'm getting them so I have something to eat while I'm cooking the other ones, right? <laughs> he has a hunger for cookies. He knows what he wants. We want the Word. We must want the Word. the word that God uses to change us. It's the word that God uses to turn us into his people. So Jesus is the new temple. He's the place where God meets us and where we meet him. Nowhere else. The Jews had goofed it all up. They had turned what was intended always to be a relationship. This was Jehovah, the covenant name for God in the Old Testament, I am. What is that? That's a relationship word. God always intended the relationship with him to be a relationship, not, not a ritual. But the Jews had taken what was intended to be a, re a relationship, they had turned it into ritual, they had turned the ritual into, into a religion, and they had turned the religion into retail. That's where they ended up. And that's where we'll end up too, unless we come to a relationship with God that's delivered by Christ, that is devoid of hypocrisy, and that is founded in truth. A British minister, Dick Lucas, wonderful minister of God, a great expository preacher over there. He, he, one time he was imagining what might have taken place, a conversation between an early Christian and their Roman neighbors. And here comes the Roman neighbor over to the Christian, and he says, uh, he says hey, I, I, you, you, apparently you, you're a person of faith. You seem, to be a, you seem to be a religious person. He says, Tim, but I haven't seen you. Where is your temple? And the Christian says, well, we don't have a temple. Jesus is our temple. So, well, it's interesting. He said, well, where are your priests? He said, well, we don't have a priest. Jesus is our priest. He said, well, where is your priest? Where, where, does, where, where do you offer your sacrifices? We don't have sacrifices. Jesus is the sacrifice. You get the picture? Jesus is everything. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you have nothing. But if you have a relationship with Jesus, what joy, right? How we can praise him, how we can come to him. This is not about a religion, beloved. It's not. I realize that religion is sometimes used in a good in a good way to mean faith in Christ. And in that sense, it's a good thing. But for the most part, we've turned religion into ritual. We've turned it into meaningless things. We've turned it into, into, into meaningless formalism and then think we're okay. Not that way. It's a relationship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word. Thank you for, for the reminder. Thank you for your power and your authority. Lord, those of us who know you are so happy to know you as our Savior and Lord. I pray if there's anyone here this morning who is not sure, Lord, help them right now to open their heart to you and to say, you know what, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I know I have guilt. I know I have a sin problem. I, I want to give it to you, and I want to have your life in return. Or maybe they just need to come and ask some questions because they're just not at that point yet. Give them courage, Father, to do whatever it is they need to do. 
Lord, for those of us who know you, would you please just increase our joy in you. Help us to have great satisfaction in knowing you. And may, the, may, may our lives be compelled and impelled by the love we have for Jesus, not by a sense of duty, but by a love we have for a Savior who's such a great Savior. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.